Hi, everyone, and welcome to MAR Talks. My name is Carrie Cavers, and I'm the founder of Moms Against Racism Canada. I am Zooming to you as an uninvited guest on the unceded ancestral lands of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, who have stewarded these lands time immemorial, such that here where I live, work, play, and raise my children, uh, we're able to enjoy and benefit from the natural beauty that is the West Coast of Canada. And if you're just tuning into our interview series, it is March 2021 and this month in honor of International Women's Day, Women's History Month and the UN International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, our theme is Revolutionary Mothering. And our theme is inspired by the book with the same name, Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines, a co-edited anthology by Maya Williams, Alexis Pauline Gums and China Martins. And revolutionary mothering explores the idea that mothering not only means taking care of one's own children, but it also means building community and ensuring survival for the future generation. A generation that'll stand on the shoulders of those who paved the way before them and who will continue the resistance against oppression. It's this radical act of caretaking and supporting life that's fundamental to raising kids who become equity champions and builders of revolutionary communities of love, diversity, and inclusion. And today we have a very special revolutionary mothering interview for you as I have the privilege of talking to not one interviewee, but three change makers all at once. So our first guest is Kemba Mitchell, who is chairperson of the West Island Black Community Association, or WIBCA in Montreal, which is a longstanding pillar of its community. I would also like to welcome the dynamic duo, Mariam Toure and Fabiola Gamalore, sorry. The co-founders and coordinators of Black Girls Gather, a book club, a book club, which is a program out of WIBCA. So um, I will start with Kemba. Kemba is a proud third generation African Canadian, a mother and a relentless activist for the empowerment and advancement of the Montreal Black community. Kemba holds a BA in human relations from Concordia University and has over 17 years of experience in customer support, project management, and international logistics management. Her diverse skill set serves her on many fronts, from volunteering with the West Island Blues Festival Committee to most recently holding a position as community development agent at a local high school. She also manages Kemba C. Mitchell, or KCM, as the owner and CEO, where she facilitates a variety of consultation services, uh, such as offering workshops and speaking engagements to address the racism and equity in the education, education system in Quebec and businesses. Kemba is a proud mentor volunteering with Big Brothers and Big Sisters of the West Island and was recently named uh, 2021 Black History Month Roundtable Laureate. She was appointed to the Lester B. Pearson Task Force on Equity and Inclusivity in 2020 and is a bi-weekly contributor on Bell Media Let's Talk radio station. Welcome, Kemba. And our second guest, Maryam, grew up in the West Island of Montreal, but her parents are originally from Guinea. She's currently in her second year at the Faculty of Law of the University of Montreal, where she's completing a Bachelor in Civil Law. After obtaining her first bachelor's degree, she hopes to continue on to complete a Juris Doctor degree and eventually become a member of the Quebec Bar. For the past two years, Miriam has volunteered at the West Island Black Community Association as a tutor for their Saturday morning tutorial program as the coordinator of their education committee and as a board member for the organization. Miriam is also involved in various initiatives promoting diversity and inclusion at her faculty and in the legal community. Her interests vary from reading and writing to dancing and playing soccer competitively. Welcome Miriam. Thank you. And our last guest today, Fabiola, is originally from Cameroon, born in Germany and raised in Montreal. 
Her being is a mosaic of the, those three cultures. She is currently embarking in her last year at CEGEP, Andre Laurendeau in a psychology oriented social science program. And after said milestone, she hopes to further her studies in psychology at any given universe or institution of higher education, mm -hmm. having a keen interest in the understanding of the human mind. She volunteers in different spaces to bring help to those in need. Her other interests consist of reading, practicing yoga and meditation and interacting with others on different subjects that enrich the human mind and experience amongst other things. Welcome Fabiola. Thank you. So thank you everyone for sharing your time with us today. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here with us. Mm -hmm. Ma'am? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us. It's really wonderful to hear about your organization and to be able to speak on it. So um, if you're all ready, and I, 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 tech is not my strong suit, so I really hope that um, this Zoom recording is working out for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, if everybody's ready, I will get started on... Uh, asking the questions and I would love to hear from each one of you if if you feel like answering uh, if you don't mm -hmm. that's okay too uh, but the first question that we've asked all our interviewees thus far is what does revolutionary mothering mean to you I don't know if Kim but you want to start, to start? okay <laughs> <laughs> well being the only mother of the three um and that really I mean, that says something, but that doesn't say it all. So as a mother, right, and as, um, as a daughter, as a mother, as an aunt, as a sister, um, for me, mothering goes beyond just birthing, birthing my children. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that's my primary. That's my primary. Those are my children. But as your children get older, right, um, the focus kind of shifts. So you have your children but there's always a need to do more. So that's where community comes into play. And in community, um, you have a vast amount of different people that you can mother, right? So I consider um, my, my volunteer work at our organization as almost also a form of mothering. We have many youth that come through the organization, both Miriam and Fabiola, you know, um, and, and the whole team, you know, I'm there. I, my role is to be a supporting, a support system, a network. And that in this, is in a sense mothering, um, supporting them and nurturing them, uh, utilizing my experiences, you know, letting the young ladies make mistakes because mm -hmm. you learn from them, you grow from them. So although sometimes I'm very, actually I'm very overprotective like a mother is, I need to know when to step back and allow everyone to make, to, to gain their experiences and, and learn from them. And uh, as mothers, we also learn from our children. So I'm very open to, you know, learning, um, you know, from generation to generation. I know what I know with my experience. The next generation after me, they've gained another type of experience and can also teach me. I like the fact when you said a rad radical act of caretaking um, radical, but sometimes I don't, for me, I don't see that as really radical. I just see it as something that we need to do. Um, it is my role, uh, as a woman, um, whether you consider a strong black woman, but as a woman and, and knowing that it takes a village, it takes a village to raise our children. I think that each of us have a responsibility to be part of that process. So when I think of revolutionary mothering, I think of just doing the right thing um, in whichever capacity you can to support our children around us and that's the community. That's my take on it. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And I think uh, how you say that it doesn't seem radical, it's, it's interesting in everybody that we've spoken to in this series, the people who are going out and doing this, they don't, see it as radical they it's 
it seems to be a consistent characteristic of just something to do. But for other people looking in, it does feel very radical in that in that caretaking and that love. So thank you very much. I completely agree with with what Kemba said, especially the aspect of building community. Uh, for me, re revolutionary mothering is really mothering that's catered to the needs of the kids of today. And I feel like it's it's very particular, especially here in Canada. A lot of us, and you you heard even from our bios, like we come from parents who are immigrants. So our family here isn't necessarily a big family of grandparents and cousins, and it's very much a core family. So like for me to be able to branch out and find people in my community who were able to act as mothers and aunts and even grandmothers for me, it was very important because most of my family is back in Africa. So when, when I was able to start volunteering for WIPCA, it was so many women who were there rooting for me and bringing forward opportunities for me to move forward and believing in what I wanted to do at school and even in my career. And the like, it's so important as a kid because Yes, you have people who love you at home and at home is your safe space. But when you go out into the world, you, you often feel like you're alone. So to have that support system, to have people who are rooting for you, that's so, so important. So we're, I think I was really lucky to, to have Wipka there to do that for me. Well, everybody said everything great. And I agree with both of you. Um, I'm a very clumsy person. So for me, when I read the question of re revolutionary mothering, um, I, I, I felt a little um, far from it um, when it came to the fact that when I got into the world of mentoring the young girls at Black Girls Gather, I never, I, I had this sort of feeling that I could not do it as well because even the role of big sister um, comes very hard to me, um, but, as you, as you um, take part in that community and take part in that work, you see that even the mistakes that you do, the younger girls are learning from them. They see that, okay, they're like mothers and people who are supporting you aren't perfect, you know, and that kind of reassures them in the acts that they do and take on in the world. And that's why I think that's really important. Yeah. All wonderful points. Thank you very much. And so you, through your, your explanations, everybody's kind of touched on it a little bit already, but in what ways do each of you practice revolutionary mothering? Mm -hmm. And it could be like you say, Kemba at home with, with your own kids or within the community or friends. Mark? Yeah, well, for me, there's two aspects. There's the at home so I I'm an older sister of my younger brother who's 16 years old and mm -hmm. so when when my mom's not here when she's working I kind of act as a mother towards him so when it comes to just uh, being present around the house having supper at the same time with him checking his, home, his homework because my parents always want me to do that it's those types of things uh, if I go like in my larger family I have my cousin who has kids and um when when I was a baby, like my cousin lived with us. So she was like my older sister. So now I take on the role of older sister, but with her kids. So it's really great to have that relationship with them and to, to be very present in their life. It's, it's I don't know, it's something I've never experienced before, especially with little babies. So I, I love that. And um, just just to see how they look up to me is, is also very, uh, it's heartwarming and it, it makes me wanna just keep going and keep going so I can make them proud. Um, and the other aspect is definitely community uh, through Black Girls Gather a book club. That's the, the biggest mentoring I've ever done. It's 20, 21 girls that we see every week. And um, that would just, we have discussions with them uh, about books written by Black authors. And it's, it's crazy because they're 12 to 18 years old. So it's quite a wide range. And Fabiola takes care of the older group. So sh she'll be able to talk to you more about that. But I'm with the younger group, 12 to 14 year old. And uh, just coming into it, I was very worried about just making sure I wouldn't make mistakes because I feel like when, when it's that age, anything you say will impact their lives. Like any little, I don't know, thing, how you'll talk about a subject, they might take it the wrong way. So I wanted to make sure I was like fact checking what I was doing and like um, talking about subjects in an honest but also cautious way. 
um, but they've, they've just been really accepting of me and accepting of my personality and accepting that sometimes I make mistakes. And um, it's, it's great. They're, they're a lot like smarter and more conscious than, than I expected. Uh, they're, they're very aware of what goes on around them and the world around them. And I think the most important for me is reassuring them and me and the other girls on our team is reassuring the girls every day like that, that like you're enough you're beautiful you're 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 amazing and you do great things and we're proud of you if no one out there is rooting for you we're here rooting for you and we're available anytime and i feel like you don't hear that enough as a kid like your mom might tell you you're beautiful your dad too but no one else is gonna say that so so if we can be that person to tell you every thursday 6 30 hi guys we love you guys we're here for you then then that's enough for me um, I totally agree with Mariam, and I like that you called us a dynamic duo because we are very similar. Um, I'm also the eldest in my family, and I have two, uh, well, a twin and a younger brother, and so I do take on that role of taking care for them when my parents are away or not there or just checking up on them, cooking, um, so I do take on that role, but uh, so at home, that is how I exude revolutionary mothering, and and. Uh, in community, it is uh, very strongly through the book club. Um, with the older girls, uh, like we're so close in age, um, sometimes it's weird to call it revolutionary mothering. It's more of like a, a big sister role or somebody to look after them, somebody to talk to, somebody a, a confidant, but to also relate to. You know, a lot of girls were not or unsure about like career paths that they want to take or where they want to go to school. And I tell them that I, I've also had that, those concerns, like a year shy away from you guys, I was also thinking and, and not sure where I wanted to go. And so they see and they understand that um, even though I, I have this other role of like being able to mentor them, I'm still a person that they can relate to and that we're not so different. And so the conversations start from there. And I think the fact that we can relate on so many things is where they can see that um, we're not monolithic because sometimes around them and in the media and in books that they read at school, they, the, we present them a monolithic idea of black people and black women. And um, once, they're, once they come into the book club, they can see these different ideas and different opinions and different experiences. And they understand that, you know, like we're all different and we all have these various experiences that form who we are. And me being able to bring that up and to start conversations like that really helps them understand and be confident with themselves. And I think that's really where I play into a revolutionary mother. So for me, um, I think it's on many fronts. So obviously, well, my daughters are both adults, actually both older than Miriam and Fabiola. But once you're, you're, you're always a mother, regardless of what age your, your, your children are. So that's in the house. Um, but I find that the mothering or, um, or nurturing aspect happens, I think, in like almost everything, everything I'm in, because it's um, for a lot of women, it's just part of who we are. We're, we're nurturers, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of comes naturally. And then um, so while at my, my, my job where I work in a school, it happens naturally with the students. But I find also the protecting and the nurturing happens even could happen even with your colleagues. Um, just the protecting happen, the protection happens a lot. I realize it. Um, but one of the things for me, in terms of that nurturing, is a lot of times you're you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, and you don't give back to yourself. And that is where um, I struggle a lot because. Um, a lot of um, individuals rely on you. And so how do you deny that? How do you, you know, but at some point you have to um, do for yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the challenges that I have uh, with that whole idea of, you know, just being there for everyone. And then you need to take time to be there for yourself. And if that means you have to step back and just take that time and uh, most individuals will understand, right? So, but that's it. So yeah, for me, it's on many fronts. Um, it, it, like I said, it's almost just a natural, a natural thing that you do. 
it's just your way of being yeah <laughs> something like that <laughs> <laughs> well uh let's then look at our last question mm-hmm. and we're the, my my organization moms against racism we our mission is to educate moms and those in mothering roles um, in values of anti-racism, cultural competence, and uh, decolonization so that they have the tools and support to dismantle racism within themselves, within their families, and within their communities. So what advice would you have for those people who want to be allies or dismantlers of racism? Um, I would start. I would say that it really starts with yourself. I think that you brought up a very important point. Um, uh, we can find in allies that sometimes they also carry uh, uh, forms of discrimination that they're not aware of. You know, and for me, it's very important that before you take on that act of you know fighting against the oppression and the cause that others can face, you realize and you check yourself. Um, it's important to do the work by, of yourself and uh, see where you, uh, in what areas do you unconsciously uh, put bias, you know? And uh, we all have uh, different biases that we are not aware of that we do unconsciously because of either the culture that we grew up in or, you know, the way that we grew up in, the place that we grew up in. And so it's really important to take a step back because once you're able to take a step back and have a very clear view of where you put the bias and you can understand where you can fight and where you can put your energy in to combat um, this virus, you know, yeah. I definitely agree. It's, it's a work that starts with yourself and it's kind of like an introspection that you have to do and you have to be very honest in that process because you can't say that you'll be an ally to me when you're, you're adopting practices that are, um, that are discriminatory discriminatory against people like me you 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 have to start by realizing that you're doing these things that that are an issue and then want to fix them and then sure I'll help you fix them and we we can move towards like a solution together but you have to be ready to do the work not not just be trying to do it for performance performative reasons or things like that so I think really to be sincere in your actions that's the most important thing because even like as the person on the other side, we're going to be able to see straight away if you're honest or if you're just doing this for other reasons. Yeah. I have to say, yeah, you guys are both on point. Um, what I wanted to add was, I think the misconception is that all Black people think the same, and we do not. Um, black people, you know, there's some commonalities, but there's a lot of differences. And those differences are based on where we're brought up, our who, how someone, how we were raised, and you know, you know, some like these two ladies that you got, you guys went to, I believe, French schools. You've had a certain experience. Um, you know, in Quebec, language plays a really major, major part. So I think it's it's actually counterproductive to put every black person in a bucket and believe that if you spoke to one black person and this is how they feel, that all of us feel that way. Um, I think you have to give um, black people the opportunity to speak or not speak about how they feel because there are some people that are, you know, they wanna teach everyone, they wanna, they, but there's some of us that, no, we don't wanna talk about, we don't wanna re-victimize ourselves. Mm-hmm. You need to pick up the book or read the documentary or listen to that podcast and you do need to educate yourself. So I think that's one of the biggest uh, concerns I have is that there's just this expectation that we're supposed to teach you and we're supposed to just, you know, and, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, I do think that, um, you know, people from non-racialized communities need to understand that when you, be, when you acknowledge the undeserved privilege, it is going to be extremely uncomfortable. But guess what? <laughs> We've been uncomfortable forever. So yeah. you need to accept that uncomfortness, like accept that and whatever comes about that, if you need to, you know, um, if you need to cry, if you need to yell, then do that. But do not do that with the expectation that we're supposed to have empathy for those feelings because um, you have to deal with those things. And then when you're ready to be open-minded and listen, 
if we want to speak about it, then that's where we can start the, 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 the progress and, and start to um, start to, for it to really be acknowledged. And another thing I want to say is, you know, last summer, you know, everyone wanted to go and, and kneel or sit or, you know, put, go to, um, you know, go to uh, what do you call it, the marches. And that's all very symbolic, right? But what did you do after? You know, because you're able to go back to your home and live within the privileged skin that you have. We do not have that opportunity. So I think that people, if you want to stand by and say you're an ally, you need to really do the work and it has to be consistent. It cannot just be, you know, you go on social media and you put a post and, oh, I put the hashtag Black Lives Matter. Like, that's just not enough. And actually for me, I find it quite insulting when people do that, but they do nothing else to support the movement. It's counterproductive and it's, 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 it's not okay. So if someone, you wanna show me, you wanna be an ally, then be open for the truth, <laughs> okay? Acknowledge it and then we can talk, but it has to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's right Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh go ahead no she's right I, she's right totally right mm -hmm. and i and i i agree with all of you i think it definitely there needs to be that openness that being comfortable with being uncomfortable and that uh taking that initiative to do the learning on your own and then outside of that like you say kimba like you've got to put that learning into action you've got to be doing things with it too so thank you very much, uh, all three of you for being here uh, and for all of the wonderful revolutionary mothering that you do for your communities. And for those who are watching, if you'd like to learn more about the West Island Black Community Association and Black Girls Gather, a book club, you can head to www.wibca org and we'll also have all of those details listed below uh, on their YouTube so thank you again um, for all that you do the world needs your radical acts of love thank you thank you, thank you. <laughs>